Join the tribe. Welcome to the Book of Life, a show about Jewish books, music, film, and web. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. What is a tribe? The thesaurus suggests an ethnic group, a caste, a clique, a family, a genus, a society. Hard as it is to define, you know it when you see it. Today, we'll explore the nature of tribes through a CD, Beyond the Tribes, a film called simply The Tribe, and a book entitled I Am My Family. Let's kick things off with a track from Beyond the Tribes by the Klezmer Company Orchestra. This amazing piece of fusion klezmer is called the Jew Orleans March, and it's the first track on the Klezmer Company Orchestra's CD, Beyond the Tribes. The Klezmer Company Orchestra is the ensemble in residence of the library at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, a very unique relationship. They perform pieces from the library's extensive music archives, but not always in their original format, as you can hear. I visited the university to talk to the orchestra director, Aaron Kula. Aaron, you use the catchphrase from shelf to stage to refer to your performance of the historical music from the archives here at FAU. Is performance actually part of preservation when it comes to music? Well, music is created for one reason, to be performed. But what we have to do is here, we have to take all of this uh, old material, uh, whether it's old printed music or old recordings or anything that's old that, that needs preservation, we have to take care of it. Because if we don't, then it disintegrates in a way that is not only not usable, but we can't even study from it. So preservation is the first step. Now. We have about 50,000 pieces of music, so obviously in my lifetime I will not perform every piece of music, (laughs) and I'll go through about 4,000 pieces a year to select about 30 pieces that I want to work with. Wow. How do you select from among so many? What's your criteria? What are you looking for in a good piece? At the core, there has to be some melodic component that is useful because the one thing that I would say all Jewish music has in common, whether it's from the Arabic tradition, the European tradition, or the Mediterranean tradition, or even the Latin American tradition, is that there's always some melodic component. It may not be very long, it could be eight notes, but one thing's for sure, all the Jewish music that I'm drawn to has some excellent melodic component. The Klezmer Company Orchestra brings historical pieces back to life but not in their original form. You blend them with these other ethnic styles and you create something new. What led you to do these mashups rather than just performing the original music straight up? Yeah, the mashups are what makes it so interesting to my generation. Now, there were two ways to approach this collection, and that is part A, is you can repeat the music, perform it again and again as museum pieces. So we do that in the symphony orchestra all the time with Beethoven and Mozart, but um, I'm also trying to revive it and kind of re-energize the tradition so that it's relevant to my generation and even my own children's generation 
and by changing it, it gives the old material a new life, it kind of refreshes it. Now, that's, that sometimes can be controversial because change is not always comfortable for people that know what the tradition was in their generation. Each generation is constantly infusing it with new elements. What, what's happening now in the 21st century is kind of a backlash from probably the past hundred years of everybody trying to be very separate and very pure. Now what's happening in the 21st century, and it's happening in classical music, it's happening in ballet, it's happening in jazz, combining two unrelated genres or unrelated musical styles so that ultimately we create a third stream of musical consciousness or alternate streams of musical consciousness. And that's really what I'm doing. You know, we're trying to figure out, well, what happens if you mix a freilach and a mambo? They're both rhythmic, they're both dance-driven, they're both celebratory, so it's kind of interesting. I'm not really reinventing the wheel, I'm just incorporating my own generation's musical style. So tell us about the CD, Beyond the Tribes. So the CD is a combination of music from the collection, but fused with Latin, Arabic, and Eastern European styles all of it encompassing both a classical orchestra and a jazz band. I think that the diversity of the CD is very interesting. There's a ballad, then we have a, a Yiddish popular piece that was written in the 40s, but we set that to a salsa beat. Uh, then we have a Macedonian piece that uses components of a melody found in Romania, Turkey, and Macedonia and I put those all together. So it, it, it's, it sounds very complicated, and it is, but musically you could sit down and just listen to it and really enjoy the cultural diversity of the music. And the title itself, um, I wanted something that reflected my idea of diversity, interfaith relationships, and I wanted to go beyond the walls of, of expectation. And so beyond the tribes, when a Jewish person hears the word tribes, they think it's about themselves. Oh, I'm, I'm one of the 12 tribes, all right? And that's very interesting. And then when I talk to my, my African-American friends, they think of the tribes as the African tribes. And so I started realizing there are a lot of tribes out there, you know. <laughs> and so if I go beyond the tribes, what was really interesting is people were asking, uh, are you talking about my tribe, your tribe, the Jewish tribe, the Arabic tribe, which tribe are you talking about? And all of a sudden it became kind of an interesting kind of plurality of a title. So Beyond the Tribes to me is another point of arrival for me philosophically as well. I'm trying to break down the barriers through music. Very cool. Aaron Kula, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for these great questions and letting me uh, go on and on about my, uh, my work. See the Klezmer Company Orchestra in concert and hear other tracks from the CD Beyond the Tribes at bookoflifepodcast.com. Tiffany Schlein directed, produced, and co-wrote, with her husband Ken, the short film The Tribe, a multi-award-winning 18-minute documentary that intertwines the story of the Barbie doll with the history and meaning of Judaism. Sounds like a tall order, but she pulls it off brilliantly. Here's a little of the film's introduction. Over six billion people live on the planet Earth. Thinking of them as a tribe of a hundred people, there would be 60 Asians, 14 North and South Americans, 13 Africans, and 12 Europeans. 30 tribe members would be Christian, 18 would be Muslims, 13 Hindus, 6 Buddhists, and 33 would be other faiths, including of the hundred tribe members, one quarter of one would be Jewish.
Within this circle, there was a woman named Ruth who created the Barbie doll. A Jewish woman created Barbie. Maybe Barbie can explain something about how this generation responds to being Jewish today. Since the old days, Jews refer to themselves as members of the tribe. Tiffany, can you explain a little about Barbie's Jewish connection and how you first learned about that? Well, it was many years ago. I went to a um, an exhibition called Too Jewish, and they had information that Barbie was created by a Jew. And I thought, that is one of the great ironies of the 20th century, that this Jewish woman created the ultimate shiksa. And I just thought it was so funny. Then fast forward many years, I was invited to this gathering. Steven Spielberg and Dave Bronx invited 40 young Jewish leaders who were not engaged in their Jewishness. And, you know, I was doing the Webby Awards and I was making films. And I went, kind of skeptically went, because I wasn't very engaged in any kind of organized Jewish life. And um, I was just blown away how people just exploded in conversation about their own Jewish identity and how they just needed a forum. People were just hungry to delve into the subject of what does it mean to be Jewish today. And that same weekend, uh, Ruth Handler, the creator of Barbie, died. There was all these very long obituaries on her because she was this amazing woman. And no one mentioned that she was Jewish or from immigrant you know, parents, and I'm like, they buried the lead. That's the most provocative <laughs> part of the story. So I thought that's a great entry point into identity and assimilation. And of course, people love or hate Barbie, so she's very polarizing. So it would be a perfect way to provoke discussion. What got you interested in exploring the concept of tribe in the first place? Well, I always love the term member of the tribe. You know, most Jews feel like outsiders. And whenever someone would say, hey, are you a member of the tribe, which I know is kind of an old school expression. I always loved it because you, you belonged somewhere. And I think, you know, when you're Jewish and you meet another Jew, it's like you, you do belong to a special club because you are such a minority. And um, I don't live in New York or L.A., so when you do meet another Jew, it's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But then I started thinking about tribe as a bigger term, like we are all part of one tribe of humanity, playing with the notion of what are different tribes like looking at it really from an anthropological lens. Most of my films look at humans as if they're this unusual species, and I'm trying to break it down and figure us out. Mm -hmm. Well, you touched on something else I wanted to ask you. In the film, the narrator says, the essential Jewish perspective is standing outside looking in. Do you think we're still outside looking in? I do think it's inherent. My husband co-wrote the film with me, and in a lot of ways, the tribe, which is 15 minutes, was us attempting to boil down, you know, 10 years of our conversations talking about Judaism into 15 minutes. And he really felt like the outsider thing was a huge inherent part of being Jewish. Like, you're really trying to, what does it mean to be Jewish? And even if you talk to people in, in Hollywood or Wall Street, which is very Jewish as an industry, ultimately at their core, they still feel like outsiders. I think that Jews uh, throughout history have gone into new lands and tried to fit in, and now, of course, we're assimilated, and there have been many other periods of assimilation with Jews, but I just, I do think it's, it's just part of our history. The film is so entertaining, but it's also very educational. In a way, it's almost like a lecture in disguise, though it keeps offering definitions of words and showing the connections between oh, things. Oh, I can't wait for you to see my new film. Yeah, yeah, very much my style. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you about that later, but so with the tribe, was it your purpose to educate viewers, and if so, what did you actually want them to learn? Absolutely. I mean, I think people are hungry for something deeper than they get in the majority of films and television. I do think the way that we learn is different today, whether it's the Internet and our brains being rewired through technology. I mean, there's this big article that's causing a big hoopla written in the Atlantic Monthly called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? Have you heard about that article? No, I'll have to read that. Uh, well, and it's the whole thing about, you know, people don't read anymore. They're not doing deep reading. You know, they know they can find the information, so they're skimming. But Socrates was worried when books came out. <laughs> it's going to ruin people's minds. It's going to, they're not going to do deep learning anymore. Uh, the youth is going to go to hell in a handbasket because, you know, 
reading is going to screw them up. So it's such a good thing to remember <laughs> because the Internet, people are so worried about our youth that it's rewiring their minds and they're not going to learn. And the reason I'm saying all this is that when you asked if the film was educational or a lecture, absolutely. We wanted to give people enough really unusual facts that they're like, wow, I didn't know that. What else do I not know? This is definitely the style of filmmaking, my last film too, where through humor and provocative links and facts, trying to have you delve deeper and have your own dialogue about these issues. So it's not just a DVD. It comes with a whole discussion kit. To us, the film is the appetizer, and the main course really is the discussion afterwards. We're kind of trying to provoke you into teaching you a whole bunch of things, and then the rest of the learning really comes on your own after the film when you do your own kind of soul-searching and conversations and reading on your own about it. Very cool. Um, do you feel like the film has different messages for Jewish viewers versus non-Jewish viewers? You know, when Ken and I were writing the script, we really struggled with, if you're not Jewish, you're not going to get this. Because ultimately, we're like, we need to understand what this is about. It needs to speak to us. And that was a big breakthrough for me creatively, you know, because I want to bring everyone into the dialogue. But if you try to have everyone understand everything, it's not going to speak to anyone. And what I really kind of came to was that if you speak your truth, you're going to speak universally. Tell us about the Hebrew Mamita. Oh, she's amazing. Vanessa Hittery, and you guys should all check out her site, Hebrew Mamita. I saw her perform when we were in midway through the script, and I saw her perform this piece, which was her journey about her own Jewish identity. It was so powerful, and I just was totally taken away by her performance. And, and, and her journey, in some ways, is what I wanted the viewers to experience after they watched the film. So we had a lot of challenge figuring out how to put her piece in the film, um, and in the end, we put her at the end, and we take the whole film into reverse as she's speaking, and it, it, I think it really worked. I have to tell you, that part where she's reciting the poem and everything's going backwards, I get goosebumps every time I watch that part. You know, it just, I'll tell you, I, it was actually a mistake that had it happen. We were, I was editing and just playing the film in reverse as she was speaking, and it was just like, it just goosebumps. I just, it was so haunting to me. It still is. I mean, I've seen it so many times, and it still elicits a reaction for me. Well, I was going to go ahead and actually finally ask you about your next film. Um, yeah, and so the new one's called Connected, A Declaration of Interdependence. And in this film, in the same style as The Tribe, through humor and unusual links and insights and archival footage and animation, I explored the way all the major issues of the 21st century are connected. So everyone's speaking about the environment, but I really link the environment to population issues, to women's rights, to our culture's obsession with beauty, to globalization, um, the Internet. I think the 20th century was all about countries and states and people declaring independence and thinking about issues in silos and isolated. And I think the 21st century is going to be a lot about understanding the links, understanding how we're connected to everything and It'll really affect the way we do everything. It'll be 80 minutes for theaters, and then we'll do a, a version for television, and then we'll have a 15-minute version for educators and a three-minute version for the web. So we've really learned a lot from our experience with the tribe and our other films to kind of cater the film to the audiences. And we will, again, have a discussion kit and really try to take all those ideas further this time. Tiffany Schlein, thanks so much for speaking with us. I enjoyed it. It's fun to talk about it again and just the process, especially now as I'm starting this new movie. Hitchcock once said, you know, you make a film three times when you write it, when you shoot it, and when you edit it. So it's always good to remember the creative process of another project when you're starting a new one. So I appreciated it. Thank you so much. It was a really great film, and I can't wait to see your next one. And it's so fun to talk to you in person or virtually in person. Tell me I don't look Jewish. Tell me I don't act Jewish. Because I'm thinking, I'm saying, what does Jewish look like to you? Because I'm the Hebrew mamita, long lost daughter of Abraham and Sarah. The sexy oi bang, matzah eating, chutzpah having, non cheaping, non conspiracizing, always questioning, hip hop listening, Torah scroll reading, all people loving. Pride filled Jewish girl. Picking up all people who are a little miffed because someone tells you you don't look like or act like your people. Impossible, because you are your people. You just tell them they don't look, period.
watch the Tribes trailer or the entire 18-minute film on our website at bookoflifepodcast.com. If you listened to the Book of Life podcasts covering this summer's Book Expo America conference, you may have heard about photographer Raphael Goldchain's book, I Am My Family. This is a sort of family album where Raphael dressed as ancestors, real and imaginary, and photographed the results. I was so intrigued by this idea that I called Raphael at his home in Toronto to learn more. Raphael, your book, I Am My Family, grew out of your photography installation project, Familial Ground. What was your inspiration for this project? Certainly the, uh, the need to produce an MFA thesis was a big motivation. The, uh, the project at the time was to invent a whole series of characters out of my memory. You know, it was, it was the, the motivation was to explore the kind of mixture uh, of cultures that contribute to my identity as a Latin American Jew who's been in Canada, you know, more than half of my life. Uh, one of the characters that I decided to do was drawn out of my memory of my grandfather. Uh, I, w- I was trying to create an image that in some way would define me. And I thought, how strange would it be to arrive you know, in a Latin American city in the 1940s with only Polish and Yiddish as your language, uh, with, with no money at all, with a child and wife to look after, and try to make a life in that world. My grandparents, uh, that was their experience. In some way, that, that image, that character, that moment, that experience defines me. Now explain a little bit about that image. This is an image where you had um, made yourself look as if you were your grandfather, right? That's right. I got period costume and I got, uh, you know, a fedora because he, he wore a fedora his whole life. He also sold men's clothes, which he carried wrapped in newspaper. So I sourced out some newspaper with Yiddish on it, and uh, I performed as him. From my memories of him, he was a melancholic character. He was uh, sometimes not the nicest person. He was a bit uh, spiny, so Mm. to speak. Uh, (laughs) You know, a little irritable. Um, So I, I sought to portray that, but I also sought to portray a kind of melancholy that oozed from him, uh, I suppose it had to do with having left nine-tenths of his family because he had many brothers and sisters behind in Poland and found himself all alone in this strange place far away. In the introduction to the book, you talk a little bit about ghosts. Tell us more about ghosts and what they have to do with this project. As I looked at the photographs that I was making, I, I was struck by how you had to look at them in two, in a way, mutually incompatible ways. One was to see me as performer, and uh, that would be sort of in the foreground. But many people were taken by the person that I was performing and would see, quote-unquote, the ancestor. And there was this flip-flop between seeing me as performer or the ancestor, but not the two at the same time, if you know what I mean. There is some visual illusions that are like that, uh, Trump the low illusions. And so I started thinking of the persona of the ancestor uh, in the self-portraits as, as a ghost hovering, haunting the self-portraits and insinuating themselves through my uh, likeness, through my f- features. Now, some of the ancestors you've included in this collection are purely imaginary, including the man on the cover holding the chicken. Tell us about that. Why did you invent people? Um, not to be flippant or glib, but I think it was fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I never really thought of this project as a kind of a slavish documentational project. I was really much more interested in creating a world from which I, I personally feel exiled. Living up in Canada and then living in Israel, I grew to feel exiled from Latin America. And then in my mid-40s, that world that I felt shifted from Latin America to, in a way, a a sort of a more abstract land of uh, that sphere, that world of family. And so I sought to create that world. For the most part, I wanted to reflect the larger Jewish world as well. And uh, my father had always assured me of the fact that we didn't have any agricultural ancestors, that everybody had been white-collar workers. And I did a genealogical research to the extent that I could and found out that many, many people with spellings 
that are consistent with my family spellings came from much smaller towns in Poland. And so I figured that some of them must have raised chickens. You know, it's a fair <laughs> assumption. And uh, I found a picture in a book uh, of, a, of a man wearing a tall fur hat, an astrakhan hat, and holding a, a white duck. And uh, I, I really liked that picture and also looked at the man's features, and I thought, I, I can do those features. My features are very compatible with his features. So uh, I set out to do that. You know, I couldn't get a hold of a white duck, um, certainly not a dead white duck. And so uh, I, I ended up with a dead white chicken. And, um, and this, this chicken came from a, a study collection at the Royal Ontario Museum here in Toronto. And uh, the chicken was in, in a pose such that it did not look alive. It looked rather dead. It was flatly posed. So I, I could only use the head part of it. Um, and uh, it, it, it was lacking an eye. So I had to put an eye in there, which I did digitally. Uh, I stole an eye from a live chicken on somebody's website. <laughs> So that's how that picture came. And once I had the picture, and once I was looking at it on the computer screen, I realized, oh, my God, um, there is a real, uh, you know, um, synchronicity between my features and the chicken's features. There's, you know, <laughs> there's this play, look, this play room here. There's, I can have a little bit of fun here. And fun and creativity and imagination and memory are all things that come from the same place. And so, you know, I exaggerated my features and I made my nose larger and more chicken-like and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, I just I just had fun with it. This collection is sort of a group portrait of your own family. But in a way, is it a portrait of any Jewish family or any family at all? Well, I started adding, as you can see from the book, I started adding people that really we have no, no, no history or memory of being in my family, like chefs or uh, soldiers, you know, or musicians, mm -hmm. even though my whole family is very musical. My son plays piano and he plays bassoon and I play guitar and I play violin as a kid and so on and so forth. And my dad is an opera net. But, you know, we don't remember any, any actual professional musicians in the family. So... These characters, I think, stem from my desire to reflect a larger Jewish world. I, I came across a picture of a chef that I just loved, so I wanted to have a chef ancestor. And gradually, I decided that these things reflected all the occupations, uh, perhaps, that, that uh, you know, Jewish people uh, fulfilled. And so in that sense, I think I was constructing a, a sort of um, a more generic kind of Jewish family. In the book's introduction, you talk about a feeling of being exiled from your Polish-Jewish ancestry. How did this project, well, did it succeed? Uh, and if so, how did this project make you feel more connected with your heritage? Uh, well, the personal process of working on the book made me feel connected. I had the names before me all the time. I was uh, exchanging emails with relatives and finding new relatives and establishing connections with branches of my family that I never knew existed through this project. So that sense of connectedness uh, came from being connected with, with the descendants of the people that I became interested in who are alive today. Raphael Goldchain, thanks so much for speaking with us. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. You can see images from I Am My Family, including the one with the chicken, on our website at bookoflifepodcast.com. The Book of Life is a podcast service of Congregation B'nai Israel of Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries online at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band at freilachmakers.com. Check our guests' websites, too, at klezmercompany.com, tribethefilm.com, and raphaelgoldchain.com. Links are, of course, provided at our website, bookoflifepodcast.com. You can also hear the latest episode by phone at 916-313-3820. We welcome your comments and questions at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and happy reading.